Life Audio. Hey, welcome to the second Gospel Rant podcast, Christmas 2022 series. I'm Dr. Bill Sinyard with Gospel App Ministries. You know, I hope we didn't lose you in the weeds, all the historical context in the first podcast. I mean, it was an important point to make that there was real cultural and political and personal darkness that God's healing light shone into in Jesus' birth. In fact, that's just what it does. And you can easily apply that to today. So many fears, so many people feel alienated and suspect and lonely and disconnected and and beat up and, and ashamed, disappointment to God. And that's what we saw in the other podcast series in parallel with this, the Sermon on the Mount. You can check it out at Gospel Rant. Jesus spoke to those very same people just 30 years later. He calls them the poor in spirit. And about them, and this is what we said in in an earlier podcast, they were the unenviable in this world. The idiom is poor in spirit. They have experienced loss or hurt or wound and can't move past them. They're mourners. They've lost face. They're disenfranchised, disempowered. They can't do anything about it. They really want to fix. They want the world to be right for God to smile upon them. They want a happily ever after ending, uh, but they're orphans here because they just don't belong. Wow. And we're going to dig into that a little more in this podcast. But also, at the end of this podcast, we have a special treat for you. Uh, It's a special skit, a drama, that hopefully will bring all of this together. I think you'll love it. Don't miss it. Uh, Pass it on to others. I think it'll it'll bring the, the whole season to light. I hope so. And give us feedback, bill at gospel-app.com. Well, before we plunge in, uh, the Gospel Rant is now partnering with Life Audio in this podcast. That means we have sponsors, so we're going to take a break, and when we get back, we'll head back to the Christmas pageant. Stick around. Hey, BJ's Wholesale Club is having their Black Friday deals. Amazing savings right now, hon. You going to get me that new laptop I've been asking for? Well, I... Oh, don't tell me. I want to be surprised. How about that smartwatch with all the features? I mean... Wait... Forget I asked. Just go to BJ's. I don't want to know. New TV. Alrighty then. Stop! Are you trying to ruin my surprise? Save up to 50% during BJ's amazing Black Friday deals while supplies last. Thanksgiving Day through Cyber Monday. BJ's. Absurdly simple savings. Hi, I'm Steve Guerra, host of Beyond the Big Screen, a podcast about the true stories behind the movies you love. In each episode, we will talk about history, philosophy, religion, art, sports, literature, and much more. Movies and media only tell you a small part of the story. In Beyond the Big Screen, we look into a wide variety of topics on the big screen and beyond. Listen now at ParthenonPodcast.com or search Beyond the Big Screen on your favorite podcast platform. All right, I am up front. I've got to say, I am not a fan of Marxism at all, by the way. I hope that doesn't offend too many of you. Uh, Let's dialogue. And in fact, here we go. I actually found a Marxist reference that I think will really help us understand the real world of abused humanity today, but also, in particular, the world that Jesus was incarnated into. Uh, Listen, very modern ring to these words. And, and please don't check out here. I'm definitely not trying to make anyone a Marxist, believe me. But dialoguing with this Marxist statement is well worth the time this Christmas. The Marxist author of Alienation of Modern Man, Fritz Poppenheim, suggests that alienation, that's the highlighted word, and its abusive stepsister exploitation are perhaps the dominant defining trends in our modern Western societies. Now, he wrote that that in the mid-60s, but I'm going to suggest that it's even truer today, 60 years later. Now, he suggests that there are three types of alienation. I mean, I love this, and I'm going to suggest there's four, but he says three. Here they are, man's alienation from himself, man's alienation from others, and man's alienation from the world in which he lives, okay? Man's alienation from himself. All right, don't check out. This is so poignant. Uh, Look, man's alienation from himself is not a new phenomenon. Certainly men and women experienced the birth pangs of this immediately after the fall in the Garden of Eden. It was at that shocking moment that our father and mother stopped seeing themselves as persons in relation 
with their perfect community, one with another, and wholly define themselves and each other as objects related in juxtaposition to the other. And by the way, exploitable to one degree or another. So I'm not a person with you, a who, I am an object for you, a what. In fact, a naked, exposed what. Does that make sense? And from that point, humanity has had to define themselves by other identifiers. So I am pretty or not pretty. I am angry or not angry. I'm a victim. I am a Taiwanese. I'm a Democrat or Republican. I am deserving or not deserving. Uh, remember, Cain, you know, I am the firstborn, so I have certain rights. And before that, Adam and Eve lived very differently. It, w- it wasn't about what they did or deserved, but primarily who they were in relationship with each other and with God, uh, right? They were intrinsically part of an inner circle of glory, a trinity plus two. And by the way, that's the whole premise of the dance, www.the-dance.org. Check it out. Well, Pappenheim, no fan of God or Christianity, gives a wonderful example of man's alienation from himself. I love this. He describes a young photographer, a good person, a person of compassion, good nature, and a good human being. Here it is, quote, He had read about a picture contest sponsored by a popular magazine, always eager to earn some extra money and to see his name in print. He decided to try for the prize. He got it for a photograph of a traffic accident, which showed the anguished expression of one of the victims in the throes of death. This action of the photographer symbolized for me the attitude of the alienated man who, possessed by a need to turn every experience into an object, a tool for attaining his ends, can ask only one question when he comes face to face with an event or a human being, what's in it for me? The young man I've been talking about is known as a very decent fellow, ready to help anybody who is suffering. If a person of this kind, when he witnesses the agony of a dying man, can think only of taking a picture, it shows that there is a cleavage between the prize-seeking photographer and the human being in him. He is alienated from the situation in which he is involved and, at the same time, alienated from himself. It seems to me that this kind of division and thought is typical of all of us. We are almost always interested in only that fraction of reality that can serve our ends. We are indifferent to the remaining realities that do not concern us. The more we advance in this separation, the more we create the split within ourselves. Close quote. You know that's cynical and harsh, but to one degree or another, isn't that the nature of all sin and we're all sinners? A good example of of man's alienation and estrangement from his fellow man can be seen in the Christmas story's innkeeper, his indifference and shaming of a dis uh, and dishonoring a fellow Israelite, probably an extended family member, justifying it correctly as an unfortunate business decision. The end's full, right? So a mother in labor is coldly sent to be with animals. This is a tragic, objectifying decision by the innkeeper. By the way, there was his bed. Just saying, where does hospitality line end? So like the photographer who may have been a good fellow on other days and other settings, the innkeeper decided differently. But the same could be said of the Roman bureaucrat who from a high, distant, alienated throne in Syria or Rome, they commanded that a census be taken in faraway Palestine so that his wealth could be quantified, heads counted, likely for eventual taxing purposes, without much consideration of how this decision would affect the lives of other real human beings, the cost, the disruptions, the hardships, the lives. Other men and women had become mere objects to be managed and controlled and, of course, profited from. And the buzzword is counted. In an honor-shame culture, it's raw shaming. So what is Pappenheim saying? He's suggesting that we live with split personalities. On the one hand, we're human and have the capacity to feel compassion and caring to one degree or another. On the other hand, we can, all of us, we can treat people like chess pieces in a game and be indifferent without even thinking of them as fellow humans at all, rather just objects to further our needs and desires. Right? Spirit-flesh dichotomy, maybe? Pappenheim reminds us that the alienation does not necessarily enter the consciousness of the perpetrator. Here's a quote. 
people who are aware of their alienation are the exceptions. The alienated man is frequently a successful man. As long as the success continues, it often engenders a certain numbness towards the price the individual is paying, towards the fact that he has become estranged from himself. Only in periods of crisis does he become aware of alienation, close quote. So he's suggesting whole societies and people groups think races and tribes and sexes, they can be subject to this spirit of alienation, consciously and subconsciously. And in the Christmas story, it's all over the place. Alienation of various groups permeates the account. There was the powerful occupying institution of Rome who regularly put the locals in their place, shamed them by force and power, and made it clear that the Jews were merely tolerated, not respected, not cherished. And there was Herod. He is a picture, an embodiment of alienation. And we're going to look at him more in the next podcast. There's so much more to talk about that you probably haven't heard. He wasn't truly Roman, not in the highest sense, nor was he fully Jewish, meaning a child of Abraham or a survivor of the exile. He wasn't related to the ruling class Hasmoneans. He was Idumean or maybe Nabataean, a son of wandering Aramaic desert tribes. And so his rise to power in Judea was as an unlikely chameleon politician. And it's telling that he is best known for the various fortresses that he built throughout the land, alienating himself with massive impenetrable walls. And I think that's telling. Being alienated, Herod was willing to use his power and influence to protect what he had built for himself, even if the results were murderous, and they often were. Look, often the most alienated and shamed people can be the most angry, violent perpetrators of alienation. So often callous decisions, probably done on a whim to order from a distance the cold-blooded slaughter of male children in Bethlehem, right? And again, we're going to do a whole podcast on Herod. Then there was international alienation. The formerly great superpowers of the East tasted alienation. So sheepishly, uh, they sent ambassadors, right? The Seiru, the Magi, who had to ask for permission, really, to make a royal visit. I'm going to say more about them in a, a future podcast. Then there was the internal alienation among the peoples of Judea and Galilee and, and Samaria. Distant relatives, for the most part. I mean, largely from the same tribe. If, but if you were a faithful, purist Jew in the land, you made it very clear by your actions and your the way you looked at people that some of the other Jews were somehow less Jewish than you. And that would include the Samaritans, right? They were considered half-breeds, unclean, or in Harry Potter terms, mudbloods. They were the Galileans. You know what? They just weren't from Judea. They weren't as religious. They were uh, and, and there was the people of the earth, the non-religious. Uh, there were the lawbreakers. There were the unclean among the Jews, and that would include tax collectors, the Herodians, the prostitutes, shepherds, tanners. And by the way, uh, think of those unclean that become part of the G Jesus story. Uh, certainly on that hillside in Galilee, think of the shepherds, think of tax collectors, Matthew, Zacchaeus. Were you a Sadducee or a Pharisee or a Essene? Were you of the wealth and powerful temple elite or a regular grunt priest who struggled to live on what he made or she made? The high priest and his entourage separated themselves from the regular priests and regular folk, too. I mean, economically, because they were ridiculously wealthy, many lived in palatial estates on Mount Zion, but they would have alienated others as being unclean and, and used the law as their bat. They had separate entrances, tunnels and bridges into the temple so they wouldn't accidentally touch a regular Jew. You know, those impure Jews? Were you an Herodian, an Idumean, a Roman citizen, a Hasmonean? Were you a friend of Augustus? I mean, you get the cultural message everywhere. There were the clean and unclean. There were the innies and outies, the righteous and the sinners, the pure Jews and the impure Jews. Doesn't that have a modern ring, Christian? Non-Christian? Shepherds, they were an interesting, alienated bunch. Uh, we're going to do a, a podcast. I'm adding, I said six, so it's going to be seven because we have to add the shepherds. We'll put it midweek sometime. They were despised by the religious fundamentalists, both for their trade and as non-people. They were the dirge of the religious Jerusalem elite. 
they were necessary, don't get me wrong, because the temple institution needed people to care for the sheep, the offerings to God. The high priest couldn't do it. It would soil them, right? That trade made a person unclean. You would be touching dead carcasses, for instance, right? Look, so what do you do? Uh, How about Joe and Mary? I'm going to say more about Mary in particular, but she knew alienation. In first, both she and Joe were uh, disenfranchised from their ancestral home, which would have been Bethlehem, we find out, the inheritance in the royal city of David. Instead, they lived with the belittled remnant of the Jews who lived like frightened, powerless mice in the alienated hill country of Galilee. Joseph and Mary, two social, alienated, really outcasts. And then, and then she becomes pregnant pre-marriage. What little social standing she was clinging to, what value she clung to uh, in her honor-shame culture was stripped from her by God. If they had been revolutionary sympathizers before, they would have been shunned by that group now. Look, amongst the zealots, you could murder Romans, but you couldn't break Toraic law. The holy war required people of upright moral authority and unwanted pregnancy that wouldn't have fit the picture and they would have been blackballed even made the butt of persecution in their own city and villages i think going to bethlehem was a respite for them so in humiliation speaking of that they obeyed their exploiters and had to go from nazareth to bethlehem mary 9 months pregnant a very dangerous really humiliating trip for both of them. I mean, Joseph, what man, what real man, if I can use that term, that idiom, would allow his wife to travel in such condition over treacherous roads at that late date in pregnancy, right? Well, I guess the same sort of man who would spit in the face of marriage laws and impregnate his betrothed and then lie about it. I mean, that's how it would have been seen. So we, the readers, know it didn't go down that way, but uh, how many other people believe that? See, often alienation can happen on rumors and exaggerations and false testimonies and lies and fears. Again, modern ring. So here's the point. Everyone in the story is tragically alienated at all three levels of Pappenheim. Alienated from themselves, who they really are as persons, alienated from other human beings, and alienated from society and social norms each is probably participating in that same exploitation that happens to others in an alienating society. That's the society that Jesus, the great de-alienator, is born into, right? With the exception of that one person, Jesus, only one character comes into the the, uh, Christmas pageant stage, the stage of history, unalienated. In fact, the great anti-alienator, Jesus, the baby. And by the way, this is where the atheist Marxist Pappenheim really misses the good news. His grand solution in Marx's was to use government and economic philosophy and regulation to defeat alienation. Well, come on, good luck with that. Uh, I, don't, I don't think he understands how bad it is. And many have tried to legislate it, very little success. It's just not going to work, of course, without the spirit of Jesus. And, and what we know is that if you put in places of authority and leadership, alienated people, which what Marx suggested, you should suspect more alienation. It's absurd, really. Alienated people alienate. Alienated people exploit. Shamed people shame. Angry shamed people murder. It's the same whether you're a capitalist or a socialist or a Marxist. You put alienated people who may be, in Pappenheim's words, good fellows, you know what? They're going to exploit others. Uh, he, that's, that's his argument, and subconsciously even, except for Jesus. That's our need. We don't need a new Ted's talk. We need a rescuer. We need a new spirit. We need a new heart. That's the point of the Christmas story. So instead, imagine someone, Jesus, comes along who is not alienated ever, and you put him in charge. You submit to him. He doesn't need to exploit others. In fact, he is a good fellow all the time. He feels compassion for the alienated, the marginalized, the exploited, the weak and poor. Matter of fact, through his lens, that's all of us. He feels splagnizomai. That's the word that's used of God and of images of God. It's not just compassion or empathy. It's, it's the thing that drives God to come and find a person who is crushed and ashamed. And he, he's moved, but he also raises them to honor. 
splagnitza mai. It's, it's a driving pursuit uh, that raises people up from the gutter to the throne. All right? That person, the, the non-alienated, has this gut-rending mercy for alienated among humanity. He's willing to die so that others are lifted from their shame. That's the nature of God's good news. That's his rescue. That's his DNA. Just look at the people on the Christmas pageant stage and how badly they needed that. And if I may, look in the mirror. See, he honors and is the corrective to the alienation experienced by Mary and Joseph. We see it in the story. He receives officially in the audience the social outcast and untouchables, the shepherds. We see it in the story. He receives, without a sacrifice or cleansing bath, foreign Gentile dignitaries and receives their audience gift. And something, in the, uh, something that the pure underground fundamentalist Jew wouldn't have done. Jesus de-alienates the Gentiles. That's in the story. He's going to embrace and honor Roman centurions, Samaritan women, lepers, people possessed with demon, the blind, the lame, the widows, the children, the women, tax collectors. By the way, per Luke, first episode is the calling of Matthew, the tax collector. The last is the calling of Zacchaeus, a tax collector. Jesus will even honor a fundamentalist freedom fighter on the cross next to him and the soldier who stood over his crucifixion. You know... He's saying, I've come so that they would be reconciled, de-alienated. And from our greatest of alienations, and the atheist Pappenheim is just not aware or is in denial of this, our greatest alienation has always been mankind's alienation from the Creator God. Jesus' death occurred to redeem humanity, us, from all alienation with God as individuals and people. We can, by faith, enter into Jesus' Gemeinschaft, that's the word Pappenheim uses to define this utopian, intimate, mutually caring, familial community within which we're really dedicated to be quote-unquote human to the others, to not exploit, where we are emotionally committed to do good, to honor others, so, so we do not feel alienation. Not perfectly here, uh, but we Christians say that's for heaven. But we should begin to taste it here, a s- spiritual gemeinschaft caused by the Spirit in us. So the Jesus revolution has ushered in, and we saw that in the the paradigm-shifting pageant stage, a heavenly gemeinschaft in which we become human again. But all those characters leave uh, the, the pageant stage a little more human. That's the point. And are more and more empowered by the Spirit to feel this splagnitzomai uh, right, the DNA of God for all others, and to see each other as humanity uh, less exploitable, and to actually be appreciated and, and honored a little or a lot. So look, today, look around. How important is this? How relevant is this? Particularly in this polarizing election season, we see we live in a global society that's clearly not Gemeinschaft. Today, we don't need to be human to others in this really utilitarian community. We seem to all too easily justify exploitation for utility reasons, and we claim that it's for the greater good. We're willing to be separate, not committed to fixing messes, willing to use others. So it's just expected that nations as institutions look after their own strategic goals first. How much are we committed to put a real dent in urban poverty and violence? Uh, Generally among minority populations who can stop at the least, What about racism in the justice system or politics there? What about the drug cartels that are making bank and human trafficking and drugs at our border? How how much do we feel compassion for the generational struggles of First Nation descendants? We still put up and even justify sometimes clearly preventable abortions above and beyond exceptions due to rape and incest and harm for the mother. And the discussion devolves into certain rights, my rights. And again, think of Jesus, the one person who could have cried out, but my right, but not my right or will be done. I mean, again, we can do better than this, people, uh, sp- the Spirit. And, and again, no judgment for me. I'm, I'm guilty of, of most of these things on a daily basis. You know, the economy has captured our attention arguably more than rampant human slavery, rampant pornography. Uh, a corrupt, self-justifying judicial system, a penitentiary system in philosophy that is as grossly dehumanizing and objectifying of men and women as you can imagine. Husbands, let's get down into the family level. Husbands all too often 
feel justified alienating and exploiting their wives, and sometimes subconsciously, but nevertheless. And even good husbands, back to Pappenheim, and in wives who often feel disempowered and alienated, so quickly turn around and alienate and exploit their husbands. The shamed shame. And by the way, singles too. We are like the good fellow photographer, or like the innkeeper, or like the religious Jews, or like Herod. These characters make sense to us. We can see where they were coming from. The, the one character that's ultimately troubling to us is Jesus, because he doesn't exploit. He comes willing to be exploited. But like the other characters, we need more than Ted's talk. We need more than new regu- regulations and laws uh, that, that Pappenheim suggests that, that supposedly are going to make us empathetic and compassionate. Really? No. We need a rescuer, not just a rescue, but we need someone who can make us experience daily a new heart, a new spirit that loves the unlovable, that chooses, is motivated to sacrifice our rights and to choose not to exploit. See, that's the new revolution that was ignited in Bethlehem. Christian, may I say to all of us, I don't wake up with that compassion for others, right? Uh, I, I generally don't wake up feeling the love of God for me. I'm shame prone. So I regularly through the day have to ask God to give me his power through his Holy Spirit in my inner being so that I would begin to grasp the height and width and length and depth of the love of God for me, but also his love for others every day. Otherwise, I'm going to be that good person and I'm going to be as utilitarian as all of the people in the Christmas pageant. So here's a prayer, and I'm offering it to you. I've used it in in, uh, three continents, uh, six countries, to encourage Christians. And I'm begging you, as I've begged them to say it twice a day, until you notice a difference. It begins to blow on our spirit-filled hearts, Christians. And here it is. Jesus follower, strictly because of what Jesus did for you 2,000 years ago, God actually loves you. He loves you with all of his heart, as much as the Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father, He can't love you any more or any less than he does right now. He loves you as you are, not as you should be or could be. You can't add to this love or take away from it. Now, I get it. It often feels like you've messed it up or need to do something so that God would like you better. Not so. How do you experience it more now? Simple. Good news. There is something that you can do and are invited to do. You can take daily baby steps to ask the Spirit inside of you, to make you know, that's important, make you know, not just help you, but make you know, experience and feel just how much God loves you right now. Just ask. Ask again later today. Ask tomorrow. Make it a spiritual habit. Look, on this Christmas Advent season, go for it. You can get this the Simple and Cluttered Gospel bookmarks at our website, www.gospel-app.com. They're really inexpensive. Hand them out of stocking stuffers this year. Pass them out at your church. You know, as I said, the one, the only one in the story who should really trouble us is the infant who had no reason to benefit personally from coming to end alienation between God and us. And by the way, caused by us after all. In fact, in the end, Jesus, to end our alienation, will allow us to perpetrate exploitation upon him. The call to arms, he says this in his first proclamation as an adult, Luke 4, 17, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, right? Here's the DNA, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, right? That's the alienated, the exploited. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and the recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Wow. By the way, in his lens, that's all of us. Some more than others, but that's all of us. Oh my. All right. I'm going to take another break to hear from sponsors, but when we get back, I promised you a drama, and it's Anne, A Christmas Carol. Uh, Enjoy it and pass it on. See you in a minute. Hey, BJ's Wholesale Club is having their Black Friday deals. Amazing savings right now, hon. You gonna get me that new laptop I've been asking for? Well, I... No, don't tell me. I want to be surprised. How about that smartwatch with all the features? I mean... Wait, forget I asked. Just go to BJ's. I don't want to know. New TV. Alrighty then. Stop! Are you trying to ruin my surprise? Save up to 50% during BJ's amazing Black Friday deals while supplies last. Thanksgiving Day through Cyber Monday. BJ's. Absurdly simple savings. Hi, I'm Beckett Cook, host of The Beckett Cook Show. I lived as a gay man in Hollywood for many, many years until I had a radical encounter with Jesus 13 years ago. Since then, I've gotten my master's degree in seminary and published a book called A Change of Affection. 
On my podcast, The Becca Cook Show, I sit down with fascinating Christian scholars and thinkers to address the lies of the culture and bring the biblical truth to bear on those lies. To start listening now, go to lifeaudio.com or search for The Becca Cook Show on your favorite podcasting platform. So welcome back to Gospel Rant. Without any further delay, here's our presentation of Anne, A Christmas Carol. Have fun. Anne rubbed her arm where he had grabbed her. She was ashamed and confused. This was just his way, she repeated, hoping to somehow still her anxious heart. She knew that she had done something horribly wrong again. He worked so hard, and he deserves a perfect meal. He really does love me. No, really. I'm going to try harder next time. She must try harder. He'll see, and maybe then my husband will love me more. Maybe then he'll look at me again. Her thoughts were swimming around like a whirlpool, chaotic and turbulent. Oh, why can't I think straight? I mean, he's right. I'm stupid. Her mind raced to a similar memory lodged so deep in her psyche. It's funny, even though she still remembers the angry voice of her father, it doesn't cause her to shudder anymore, not like it did for years. It's just another memory, another failure, You are a loser, and you'll always be a loser. Hmm. But as bad as the words were from his enraged lips, it was the way he wouldn't look at her that was the worst. She can still remember his disgust. Dad, it was a mistake. I didn't mean to. Get out. Get out. Get your act together, and don't ever bother me again. She paused, took a breath. Just now aware of the painful tension in her face, another breath, and she remembered why she was there. She looked down at the child in her arms and remembered. This child was, in a strange way, unnerving to her. She had never known anything quite like him. His huge brown eyes just watched her. Wondering eyes, wonderful, but sad, she thought. The wet wide eyes were totally locked on her face. She almost smiled, imagining if there was anything that would distract this child from its silent, urgent investigations. His stubby hand reached up to touch her cheek gently, clumsily, and yet his eyes. Funny, it's as if he knew her thoughts, her confusion, her shame. The child doesn't know her, she thought. Not really. If he knew what a loser she really was, the mistake she's made, he wouldn't be so interested in her. He would no doubt prefer to look at some lifeless, perfectly proportioned doll. Ah, she shuddered from the depths of her core. It brought her wondering thoughts back again to his eyes. He knows. Could he know? Sad eyes, she thought. Maybe something else. She couldn't be sure. But they seemed, yes, they seemed to react to her thoughts. It's as if there was no one else on the planet, at least for him. He just gazed at her, deep into her. Was this what it felt like to be wanted, to be attractive, to be desired? She shuddered again. Girl, what are you thinking? Don't go there. Those are crazy thoughts, crazy idealistic hopes for those who aren't losers. And still, the child adoringly gazed at her eyes. Sad eyes, she thought. Maybe something else. Well, it was time. Anne looked around her at the crowd, rows and rows of mirrored faces, all shattered. Battered women, abused children, ashamed teens, Men betrayed, losers, the marginalized, the objects of hate and racism and bullying and despise, the suicidal, the depressed, the mocked, the ridiculed, the ugly. She recognized many of her friends and neighbors there. Mirrors, fractured mirrors. She shuddered again, deep from inside, but this time the shudder was warm, little, and different. Hope is a strange feeling for Anne, and so often a word with so little meaning. But not now, not at this moment. Anne gently but reluctantly handed the special child back to his mother. He had her eyes. She was only a child, too, so young. 
and wondered how she managed the shame of having a child out of wedlock. How does this one so young bear the oppressive burning stares from the socially righteous? She had his eyes and stared at Mary for a long time and wondered what she was thinking, what she would do next. Mary quietly and reverently held out the infant, the immensely approachable God, the eternal King, the one who adores the unadorable and handed him to the next weary pilgrim. After what seemed to be a long time, Anne slowly opened her eyes. She shook her head a bit to try to get the cobwebs out. For a moment, she couldn't remember where she was. It was the sanctuary and Christmas Eve. She had come alone to watch the annual children's Christmas pageant at her church. She had only a few childhood memories that were good, and she still smiles when she remembers her joy at being chosen to be one of the angels. Her family didn't come to see, but everyone else knew only the really cute girls would be angels. Anne rose from her stiffened knees. How long had she been there? A pain surged through her legs and side, softened by the warm rush of blood that flooded back into her calves. She looked around her silently. The sanctuary was very quiet, empty now. The nativity candles were still flickering, struggling at the end of their journey, and the silence echoed in the hall. There was a cool breeze that surrounded her. No doubt a window was open. How long had she been there? All she knew for sure was that she's not going home, not to him. She's not sure why, maybe hope. For the first time in a long while, she doesn't feel like she is alone. Somewhere, there is someone who knows, who sees. There is someone who desires her, deeply longs to look into her eyes as she is. You know, it's all about the child. O holy night, the weary world rejoices. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I want to take just a second to thank the team at Life Audio for their partnership with us on this podcast. Next time, like I said, we're going to do a gospel rant look at the story of Herod. It is fascinating. There is a lot of stuff that you probably have never heard. So don't miss it. And again, pass it on to one other person. Make it part of your Advent season. Until next time, take heart, child of God. Hey, BJ's Wholesale Club is having their Black Friday deals. Amazing savings right now, hon. You gonna get me that new laptop I've been asking for? Well, I... Oh, no, don't tell me. I want to be surprised. How about that smartwatch with all the features? I mean... Wait, forget I asked. Just go to BJ's. I don't want to know. New TV. Alrighty, then. Stop! Are you trying to ruin my surprise? Save up to 50% during BJ's amazing Black Friday deals while supplies last. Thanksgiving Day through Cyber Monday. PJ's absurdly simple savings. It's a crazy world out there, moms and dads, and raising our kids to stand strong in the faith is tough. I'm Katherine Seegers, host of Christian Parent Crazy World, a podcast that answers the questions that keep us parents up at night. Questions like, um, is it okay to question God and the Christian faith? How do I help my kids to have an authentic faith? Wait, wait a second. Is the Bible just a book written by some ancient dead guys? <laughs> yeah. For answers to these questions and more, subscribe to Christian Parent Crazy World at lifeaudio.com.